Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Watch and Learn course, Tackling the New Normal, Keys for Success After Reopening Buildings. My name is Janelle Penny. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Buildings, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this course today. I'd like to begin today by thanking our partner, Arc Facilities. Please check out their website. We encourage you to ask questions during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, just click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions at any time, but most questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. If you experience any technical or audio difficulties during this broadcast, please send us a message in the Q&A box or contact us at 1-800-553-8878. And as an important reminder, you can also access a copy of today's presentation slides on the Resources tab on the course page on our website. On behalf of Stamets Communications Incorporated and Buildings, we're pleased to announce today's course is worth one hour of health, safety, and welfare credit with the AIA for continued education. Here you can find our provider number as well as the course number. It's also approved for one CPD credit from Bomai International for RPA, FMA, or SMA designation programs, as well as one maintenance point toward credential maintenance with BOC. Following the course today, you'll be redirected to the Buildings Education site where you can submit for credit. Note, though, that you must be present for the entire course to gain credit. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters, David Trask, Mark Reed, and Darren Branham. David is the National Director at ARC Facilities. He's presented at numerous facilities associations and conferences across the U.S. and Canada with a focus on helping organizations, hospitals, universities, and school districts better manage their information, be more productive, and reduce risk. With years of experience in the built environment, he shares best practices for leveraging innovative technology that drives efficiency. He's also a member of the IFMA.org Education Committee. Mark oversees security, safety, emergency management, PBX, parking, and numerous other programs. He previously was the security manager at Huntington Hospital in Pasadena. Mark spent 15 years working in law enforcement at various federal, state, and local correctional facilities where he oversaw security operations for an incarcerated population. Mark was also honorably discharged after serving eight years in the U.S. Army. He holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from Arizona State University and is pursuing his Master's of Business Administration through Western Governors University. Mark is also certified in Homeland Security from Arizona State University and a Certified Healthcare Protection Administrator through the International Association for Healthcare Security and Safety. He is a volunteer leader with ASIS and has held various leadership positions for the Greater Los Angeles Chapter, and he is currently the Chair of the LIOC Chapter of IAHSS. Mark was recognized by Campus Safety Magazine as the 2019 Director of the Year. Darren is the Emergency Preparedness Manager and Life Safety Manager at UW Bothell and is responsible for emergency preparedness, fire safety, and all aspects of environmental health and safety. He previously held the position of Fire Prevention and Life Safety Specialist at the UW Seattle campus. And with that, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers. Welcome, everyone. Hey, thank you so much, and welcome everyone, and it's great to have you all here. This is David Trask. So these last few months have been, well, just completely unexpected, and as facilities professionals begin returning to work during this pandemic, as our panelists will discuss today, they're facing new and completely unprecedented challenges. To overcome these challenges and adhere to recommended guidelines, which are now becoming the new normal, teams will need to be more mobile, agile, and productive. We're going to discuss various aspects of returning to work amid the current situation, and I'm looking forward to discussing with our panelists, Mark and Darren, and seeing how they're embracing these challenges and learning some tips on what we can do moving forward with opening up other facilities. So let's go ahead and get started with the poll questions to kick things off. So, as buildings and campuses begin to reopen, how prepared is your team? Please choose from one of the ones below, fully prepared, mostly prepared, somewhat prepared, or you're st struggling to prepare. We'll share the results immediately after you vote. Okay, we're about to wrap it up. Okay, 
the results should pop up here. Okay, so it looks like the leader here is mostly prepared at 48%, somewhat prepared at 39, and only 9% say they're fully prepared. And of course, you've got uh, struggling to prepare at 4%. That's interesting. Well, it leads us to one of our first questions here. So for our panelists, as buildings and campuses begin to reopen, what additional responsibilities are facilities teams facing? You know, how are you prioritizing those responsibilities? You know, how fluid is that situation? And what, what are your ex expectations long term? Let's start with Mark. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, so for our facilities teams, a lot of it is encompassing of a robust risk assessment uh, when it comes to responding to the, the new normal. Um, as, a, as a healthcare facility, you know, we've been in the thick of it from, from early on. And you know our our facilities team has done an amazing job and really adapted and and you know been able to to change on the fly. We've converted numerous spaces to negative air pressure to to assist with the surge, um, and then just gone through and identify you know di different areas, you know where do we need to input some workspace controls, um, what type of screening do we need to do, um, just going through space by space. To, to really see, you know, what areas are going to be impacted, you know, social distancing. Um, obviously, we've, we've adopted a universal masking policy here at the hospital. So everyone that comes in and wears a mask and screening processes. Uh, we, we take everyone's temperature uh, through a thermal camera. Um, and, you know, that was, that was something that isn't very common, I don't think, previously. Um, so our facilities team being able to adapt to these new technologies, these new processes, and you know, figuring out how we how are we going to leverage our people, our process, and our technology going forward, and then just you know, prioritizing and strategizing the risk and what areas need to be dealt with first. We've uh, expanded our emergency room and pushed out to some alternate care sites through the use of uh, some tents and things like that. Because um, we really anticipate a large surge and in influx of patients with COVID-19 and things like that. We want to make sure, you know, our, our main priority is ensuring we're keeping the safety of our staff, our patients, and visitors here at the hospital at the forefront. And the last thing we want is when people are coming to the hospital to have to be worried about, you know, am I going to be exposed or infected? Um, our facility team has really done a great job of creating those barriers and, and going through and re-envisioning those spaces to to adjust to what we have sure yeah no and that's that's i've seen that firsthand myself mark i i was actually at a hospital in the east coast last week and just the process of even entering the building was completely different you know you walk through the line and they've got the markers on the floor and you know where you stand here and then they check your temperature and then they ask you the questions have you been exposed do you know anybody who's been exposed just that's completely turned on its head what the new what this new norm really looks like uh mark why don't you tell us a little bit about how it's in or i'm sorry uh darren tell us a little bit about how it's impacting your facilities and what are you doing yeah thanks david so basically we're kind of looking at it as the new future of what we need to do and how we need to do things to bring people back and reopen so we have to maintain our social distancing we have to look at floor plans of our spaces where people are working, our classrooms, everything from the business aspect to the academic aspect, and then change those things up where we're allowing less people to be in uh, rooms, classrooms, meeting spaces, and, and things like that. Also, we've had to put additional signage like you see on the slide here and talking about the attestation of people coming to work or coming into campus to make sure that they're not having any signs or symptoms. And some of the other challenges that we've faced is that, um, you know, this was a new thing for everybody to adapt to and try to, uh, you know, figure out how to do it as Mark was talking about. And then we had to change the way that some of our facility teams actually did their job. So for example, basically we took our grounds crew that normally would be out cutting grass and doing uh, yard work and things like that all over campus. And we focused on cleaning for quite a while in uh, February and early March. And we were up here in the Seattle area, we were kind of the epicenter 
for uh, the COVID outbreak. We had the first case in the country and hospitalization in our backyard. And then just a couple miles down the road is where the giant outbreak occurred at one of the healthcare facilities. So we were constantly monitoring things and what was going on and changing, but we had to focus on touch point cleaning. So our grounds crew got pulled off of their duties and taking care of the grounds and basically started cleaning door handles and outside of the pay stations, our uh, custodial crew started doing the touch point cleaning three times a day, every shift. And so that was a lot for them. And they put down uh, their additional duties that they would normally do on a regular basis. And it was, you know, an adjustment for them to make sure that they covered everything so that we can make sure that we had a clean facility and maintaining things. And then basically during the time that we were working from home, there's not a lot of people on campus. They were going through and doing a deep cleaning of campus facilities and places. And then we were, um, basically shutting down the buildings and the classrooms and posting signage on it that says this room or this area has been clean please do not enter to make sure that we keep everybody safe and this was a new norm for them and something that they haven't faced before so it was a little bit of a challenge at the same time they rose to the occasion and basically changed their schedules changed their daily routines to help with this and and are ready to reopen as we've moved into another phase where we can slowly start bringing some people back onto campus it's still one of those things where you've got to go in and make sure that everything is cleaned up and the uh, the job has changed a little bit for them and they've, uh, you know, rose to the challenge and tried to figure out how do we best do this and maintain everything. And it's it's been an, an adventure. So um, that's one of the things that we're going <laughs> to working on as well. No, and that's a great segue to our, our next poll question here, which is, how will social distancing requirements impact the daily activities of your team? Significant impact, moderate impact, minimal impact, or no impact? Please cast your vote here. How is it impacting your daily activities of your team? Give it just a minute and we'll let the results out here. Okay. Thank you all for voting. There you go. That's what I expected. It's a significant impact, 46%, moderate impact at 36, and then 15 and 3 here. But I think this is, this is becoming the new norm. Like you both mentioned, the new norm is this, is this can't not impact your facilities and the way your teams work. So let's jump over to our next question here. And let's start with Darren here. So Darren, how will social distancing requirements impact your team's overall productivity? You mentioned just a second ago that you're pulling teams off of different departments to help with that deep cleaning. Is it, but also, how is it going to impact you guys like shared resources, like with computers or even the way people are sitting within an, an office area or even going up to the copier, let alone they're going into that plan room where they've got all those documents but they're in a 10 by 10 room and you've got a whole team that needs access to that stuff, let alone what I've heard multiple times in the field is because it hit so fast and the shutdown really hit so fast where everybody was shutting down. Now I don't have that stuff digital where I can, my guys and gals who are in the field are now all working from home. How do they get access to that stuff? So talk a little bit about how this has impacted your teams as well, Darren. Yeah, so basically, in order to keep our team safe, we've actually opened up additional rooms and spaces for them so that they're not all crammed into one small room. You're trying to put 10 people into a room that's only built for, you know, say, three or four people. And so we've had to create these extra spaces, but that divides up the team and makes it a little bit more challenging for them to uh, collaborate together to figure out what kind of work things that need to be done. It also requires more emailing and more um, remote type access to things that people aren't used to. And so as you see in the picture here, you've got a bunch of people looking at some plans and they're pointing to things. And, and today's, you know, requirements, we can't have that. So basically you're going to have to have some type of meeting uh, remotely or virtually to talk about those things. And it, and it takes away from the actual collaboration of everybody. And then we have to do that to keep everybody safe. And unfortunately, more questions arise or you get the, uh, you know, everything's lost in translation there when you're trying to work through a, a problem or an issue. 
And it also makes it a little bit harder when you can't be physically up, you know, next to somebody working on things. And we've also had to shift our focus of what we're working on as far as our work orders and things like that. We're doing, try to do more and more things that only requires one person at a work order. So something that's a little bit more complex, we've had to either put that off or we've had to go back to the drawing board and figure out, okay, it's going to take X number of personnel to do this. How do we get all those people together safely to complete this job? And is this a task that we can put off for a while, deferred maintenance or whatever it happens to be, if we can't have just one person work on it. And then if it's a critical thing where we need multiple people, we actually have to have a timeout, talk about a plan, how to keep everybody safe, make sure everybody's attested that they're not having any signs or symptoms. And the other thing this has done for us is that we have a lot of construction going on. So the productivity of our construction and our interaction with our staff on a regular basis for these two large projects we're doing has slowed things down immensely because we're waiting and taking a lot longer to get our certificate of occupancy for these uh, construction projects to get wrapped up. The punch list is a little bit uh, harder and longer to get completed. So there's a little bit more of a challenge of it and it's you know, we're able to do it, but it's just taking a lot longer and you're having to jump through a lot more hoops and a lot more steps to keep everybody safe. Yeah, you know, and that's, that brings up some really good points. The new norm also means you've got, you've got to reopen. You've got to figure out how to reopen, but what I've seen around the country, too, is that the projects are still going. A lot of those projects are still going. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't mean that business completely stops. But how do you work in that type of an environment, especially when your team is, is remote and you're working with those contractors? So, Mark, tell us about your experience. No, David, I think it, it's kind of like what you said. You know, business doesn't stop. And we just have to adapt and change. Um, you know, in healthcare, we, we leverage technology uh, really quickly to, to adapt to this change in the environment. Um, stuff where normally a patient would come in and have an appointment or we're leveraging and utilizing telehealth. Um, a lot of times, you know, a meeting that we would have had in a conference room and have a bunch of people in there, now we're leveraging, you know, virtual meetings like Zoom or Microsoft Teams and things like that. Um, and, you know, and it, it does impact the overall productivity because you don't have that interpersonal communication, you know, you're not there and able to interact, but it, you know, we have to adjust to that. Um, and that's, that's, you know, it's gonna take some time. And I think, you know, just going back to leveraging the technology and, and utilizing tools that are out there to help us out to, to impact that. You know, when it comes to our projects, you know, like, like the picture shows, we, we'd sit in a room with some blueprints and everyone have some input and go over it. And, you know, luckily for us, we, we were positioned in, in a good spot when this all kicked off. But, you know, before we would have, you know, emailed a PDF or some drawings around, everyone would have commented. And as that goes around, you know, by the time you get to that 10th person, they, not, they might not be working on the most uh, up-to-date uh, information because it's, it's changed with a couple other people. Um, so we use, you know, different platforms. Uh, Arc Facility, your guys' uh, platform for one, really helps because everyone has the same blueprints. They're able to all look at it simultaneously. If I make a change, now you're able to see that change when you look at it and we can build upon it and things like that. Um, you know, our IT department did an amazing job when this first kicked off um, and just adapting because we put a lot of staff all of a sudden, I don't need the finance team here at the hospital per se, you know, uh, not maintaining social distancing. And there's, there's certain things that they can do from home. Um, you know, so we spent a significant amount of man hours originally identifying who can we work from home and then what do we got to do to support that? Um, you know, that, that, that's hardware and software. We had to make sure that we had enough laptops and enough, enough equipment that we could then issue to them to be successful working from home to hopefully not have a huge decrease on that productivity, but as well as leveraging the software and the technologies where we're still, you know, collaborating and, you know, moving the needle and, and making an impact, um, you know, how do we do that? Uh, you know, not everyone had a Zoom account or Microsoft Teams set up or things like that or, or access to our ARC facilities because, you know, they, they, they might not have used it in that capacity and been physically present at the meeting. But now they need those accesses and be able to adapt and, and respond to that. So our IT team set up uh, early on a, a mini command center just to handle and address all those various issues that came in and be able to, to filter that, triage it, prioritize what, 
who needs what first, and then, you know, who can we get to later on uh, to make sure that we didn't have that decrease in productivity. So the, the biggest thing when it comes for us for social distancing is, you know, how can we leverage technology to, you know, cover that gap that we're now going to be seeing? No, that's, you know, Mark, you're, you're both hitting it on the head here, and it's, it's that remote. I keep hearing the word remote, remote, remote over again, and it's, it, that's what it's all about. You know, you went from everybody being on site to the vast majority of folks being off site, and if you can't access the stuff that you could when you were normally sitting in front of your computer or you're normally walking into that plan room, it, you're in trouble. So I think that what it did is it really forced people to take a hard look on, on how we can do that. How do we take a look at, at, at getting access to everybody, but then also that collaborative, collaborative mindset. So that leads me to our next question here. So our poll question is, so your organization's response to COVID-19 has resulted in permanent staff reductions temporary staff reductions and no, or no staff changes at all. How has this impacted your facilities? How has this impacted your teams within your organization? Please select one of the ones below. Okay, we're wrapping it up here. And our results. No staff changes, that's outstanding. So 64%, no staff changes. Um, temporary staff reductions, maybe that's furloughed folks or, or hopefully not permanently laid off folks, but then you've also got 15% as permanent staff reductions. You know, I think this has really forced a lot of folks to figure out how to do more with less. So let's go on to our next question here. So how can teams recover from temporary or permanent reduce staffing. So I know, Darren, you mentioned earlier that, you know, that backlog or putting some of those, uh, putting some of those traditional work orders that you guys would just knock out because you couldn't send multiple team members out to work on it. So now they're possibly deferred or how is this impacting also your PM activity? So that preventative maintenance stuff. And I know Mark in hospitals, you obviously have additional PMs that you're probably having to do with those those special uh, COVID areas within the building. So let's let's go ahead and start with Mark on this one. How has this impacted you? Well, I mean, from the hospital perspective, originally we actually had an increase in temporary staff to, to anticipate the patient surge. Um, and then as time progressed, you know, we started evaluating the needs. Um, and some of those staff that maybe we didn't have a, their traditional role for them, um, kind of like Darren said, we, we, we had to repurpose and then we identified new things um, that we didn't necessarily have before. Um, so, you know, while some of the admin staff, you know, because we're now working from home and, and their workload significantly decreased um, in some aspect, but, you know, now we have a thermal camera and we have to have staff monitoring, you know, asking questions as such of, you know, have you uh, come in contact with anyone infected, or, you know, straight off? Have you had any international travel? And, and some of our screening protocols, you know, that's that's somewhat labor intensive um, originally. So we, we just repurposed staff and, and found, you know, new roles. And a lot of times it wasn't traditional. Um, and luckily, or thankfully, I guess I should say, our staff was very receptive. You know, it wasn't about, well, that's not my job and that I don't do that. You know, everyone came together very quickly and early on, you know, here's our mission. What can I do to help? I get that that's not what I normally do, but I, I have no problem adapting and let's let's figure this out together. And what do I need to do to support the cause and and things like that. So really when it comes to recovering from temporary or permanent reduced staffing, one is repurposing people, um, identifying, you know, what's some strengths that we weren't leveraging before and what can they do now to help out. And then you just evaluate the workforce. Um, you know, I think when times are good, we tend to have some, you know, extra staffing or extra stuff. And then, you know, as the economy changes and we have to respond and adapt and the needs of business, we identify, you know, how can people leverage and maximize um, their skills? And we got to do more with less sometimes. And, you know, just, just having a, a 
strategic plan when it comes to that and how you're going to do it um, to obviously meet the needs of the business, but also keep it in mind the, the people aspect and, and how this is going to impact the overall organization. Because, um, you know, it's so fluid. We just don't know, like, is this, is this temporary? Is this going to become permanent? We, we don't know still. Um, right. We saw a huge reduction in our ER volume of patients and some of our census go down. But now, you know, we're seeing a, a large uptick um, and we're getting a lot busier now as things return to normal. Um, and I think as we see things return to normal, you know, we're still going to need those, those staff, but we're just going to need them probably in different ways. Certainly. No, and that's, that's really good, really good feedback and helpful for a lot of our, our listeners here. So, Darren, how is, this, uh, how is this impacting your facilities with staffing? So, fortunately, we have not seen a reduction in our staffing, which is a good thing. And as kind of Mark talked about, we've had to repurpose some of our staff. For example, that I used earlier is our grounds crew. Uh, we've pulled them off of some of their duties temporarily to come inside and help clean and assist with that kind of things to get stuff done. Uh, one of the other things is uh, our sustainability coordinator. We kind of put sustainability on hold temporarily uh, during this time frame so that uh, she could assist me with emergency operations because all of a sudden we got thrown into this and uh, we haven't seen anything like this before and we're working on over 100 days plus now. So that was a, a lot that we had to pull together in a short amount of time. So we kind of repurposed people for different tasks and things, but at the same time, they still have a regular job to do, but we added some additional duties and said, all right, for this time frame, we need you to work on uh, X, Y, and Z related to the emergency response and or whatever technology that we have that we're using for making sure that people know what's going on. And then like Mark had said, people didn't really say, okay, that's not my job. They just kind of pitched in and they did what they needed to do because this is unprecedented times we've all seen. And, you know, a couple of people thought the other day during a meeting, like, oh, we just thought this was going to, you know, be a two week temporary thing. And next thing you know, here we are hundred plus days into this and we're still not sure what our future has for us. But um, we have had a few people uh, leave for another position, which is kind of interesting. You know, there's a lot of talk out there about people, not changing jobs in the middle of a thing, but a couple of the people that we have on our staff had uh, presented a, a new opportunity and they've taken it. And so now we're trying to figure out how do we do that? It's not a, a permanent reduction in staff or anything, but we are going to uh, rehire for those, but how do we pick up the gaps for those people right now? And we're also looking at, you know, prioritizing our work orders. What are the things that we need to do? What are our preventative maintenance things that we can hold off on? And also mm -hmm. what we talked about earlier is the social distancing. What can we have people do that only requires one person? Now that things have calmed down just a little bit, we have a little bit, uh, the analogy we use is basically we're kind of in the eye of the hurricane. We've seen the first wave come in. We're in this little low right now. We're waiting for the second wave or what's next to come in. And during that time frame, we're trying to figure out what can we do, go do and get taken care of that's been on the punch list for a long time or what does part of our preventive maintenance look like? What can we send staff out there to do to keep them busy? Because we we can only clean so much and with not having a lot of people on campus, that takes away from that. So now we're focusing on these projects that we haven't been able to get to for a long time during our preventative maintenance or our deferred maintenance and things like that. So that's actually work, working out really well. We're able to knock down those work orders that have been outstanding for quite a while now. And then we're trying to make sure that we keep people busy. That's the other thing is and we're kind of changing uh, shifts for people. So that goes back to the social distancing. How do we do that? Well, we've also looked at, okay, if you've normally worked day shift, if you would volunteer or would like to work a different shift or different hours to be socially distanced from other people, you still have a position and you still have plenty of work for you to do. That's how we're handling a lot of that stuff. And then hopefully once things kind of, uh, you know, get back to whatever the new future normal is going to be, we have to look at it and, and continue this on a regular basis of how do we take care of these people and what are we going to do to get the work done at the same time. No, that's, that's outstanding. And thank you both for that, because I think that's, uh, that's interesting that it, it is a direct impact, but to hear that both of you have had minimal downsizing of staff is outstanding. So let's jump into our next poll question here. So how much of your health, safety, and emergency documentation still exists in paper form? So you've got binders or, or they're in a, a book someplace. A high percentage, about half, a low percentage, or you're unsure. Please select one of the ones below. Okay, we're 
we're going to wrap up here in just a second. Okay. And our results are going to pop up. So this is interesting. Look at that split. It's pretty even across the board. So a high percentage still have it in paper form at 23, about half, 21, all in the 20s here, a low percentage or unsure. That's interesting. That's really interesting that it's split evenly across the board. So let's jump into our next question here. And that leads us to, well, how will you ensure that everyone is working from the latest health, safety, and emergency documentation? We just saw it. It was an even split across the board. So you think about it. You've got a binder. Well, how's that binder going to help your team when now half of your team or all of your team is working from home? Or you know, how are you changing that? You've got a paper binder, so now you've, you're changing that because it's a moving target right now with the way changes are going in local city or local county, state, federal, and CDC. I mean, it's constantly changing. So how are you updating those binders and distributing those? But it also can be really time-consuming and expensive to print that stuff out. So let's, let's go ahead and start with Darren here. How are you guys managing that process and making sure that everybody has the most accurate current information in their hands. Thanks, David. I'm, I'm glad to see that a lot of people um, voted that way because it was kind of surprising. But at the same time, this is a, an incident where we still have our infrastructure. We still have access to the internet and plans and things like that. And I'm a big advocate for keeping a paper copy because, you know, Murphy's Law pretty much is like internet goes down or you don't have you know, your computer systems or whatever it happens to be and you need that. And then everybody goes, oh, where's that binder? Oh, it's on the shelf. I haven't looked at that thing in years. But uh, that's an opportunity to take that binder, update it after this and to figure out what worked, what didn't work. You know, usually, you know, after a, a big incident, you need to go back and do an after action report and figure out what's working. But the challenge that we're finding with this one is that no matter what format we're using, things change so constantly. It's almost a daily basis. So like some things that happened right. on Friday have already changed for what's coming up today. And so we're continually having team meetings and our stakeholders uh, meet three times a week to get the latest, greatest information. Then we disseminate that out to the rest of the people that need to know. And so uh, we have to refer people to a website or to whatever platform that we're using and say, no, here's the latest, greatest. And our IT staff is doing a great job making sure that's working and making sure that's updated and then i'm sure that everybody you know out there has had a huge increase in their email communication it's the last thing that you really want and need but sometimes that's the only way to communicate right now um, but it's also forced us to pick up the phone and talk to a lot of people that we normally wouldn't talk to because we're not seeing them uh, passing them in the hallway or you can, can't drop by somebody's office right now just to you know touch base with them and or you see them in the, in the break area or go out to lunch and things like that. So you don't have that um, luxury right now. So we want to make sure that everybody's working from the latest, greatest information by putting that information out there to them. And it might be that they're getting an extra email or two or, oh, hey, by the way, since uh, we met last week, here are the new changes. And what the, one of the things that we've been doing as well is sending out a, a situation report. Uh, we used to do it daily. And we've scaled it back to three times a week now. And so we put the latest, greatest information up front, bold it and highlight it and say, here's what changed from last time. Here's the new information and what you need to know. Unfortunately, the situation report is multiple pages long, but um, that comes out three times a week. And we do ask or expect people to read that to be on top of it. And we also use some technology we'll talk about a little bit later coming up here of how you can go in there with the click of a button and be on top of the latest, greatest information. And so that way everybody knows. But our challenge is that it changes so rapidly and you can say in that, you know, what we did last week might be different this week. And then uh, next thing you know, the state or the county has come out with new guidelines or uh, the CDC has said something now. So we're trying to figure out, you know, what is it that we want for everybody and how does it impact us? And it takes a little bit of time to work through that and make sure that everybody's on board so they have the latest and greatest information out there. But, um, you know, I, I tell everybody, could you imagine if we didn't have our infrastructure, we didn't have the power, we didn't have Wi-Fi, and we didn't have computers and all the different things that we're using on a regular basis. Can you imagine if this was an earthquake and we didn't have that ability to have Zoom meetings and things like that and people couldn't get to our campus and our facilities and things like that. So I try to, you know, reassure everybody that, you know, this will pass, we will get through this. 
but we want to also make sure that you understand where and how to get the, the latest, greatest information because in another type of scenario, you may not have this luxury with the infrastructure that we currently have. So it's important to make sure that everybody is working from that and it might require an extra email too, like I said, but also at the same time, people have to be forced a little bit more into uh, looking at their emails or double checking and making sure but with a situation report we send out three times a week that says here's what's changed here's what we need to do and here's what we're going to be doing uh, moving forward and you, you can't catch every single person or everybody out there but we try to at the very least and then we give them a space to go back to and one of the other things um, is that we have that recorded and we have it written down. So if somebody misses it or they were busy, that's one of the other problems we're finding is that people are just double, triple booked for different things right now. And if you're not able to make it, we have a place where all that information is stored. You can go back and look at it when you have time. You know, Darren, that's interesting because I was actually just meeting with a client earlier today and, and we were talking about that very thing. I said, where is your stuff stored? So when you're communicating with your team, how many spots? And by the, I think my, my pen almost ran out of ink, but by the time I got done, we counted 14 spots, 14 different spots that stuff was located, whether it was internal, whether it was with a particular program. And then the question came up, who can access that stuff? So it, it just raised a whole bunch of red flags for folks. When you think about, really sit down and think about how many different spots that that stuff lives. Is it one? Is it 10? Is it 20? And then who can access it? The information is only as good as somebody can get at it. So, Mark, why don't you jump in here and share your information? Yeah, I think over the years, I mean, any after action I've done or, you know, response to any disasters or incidents, the biggest issue is always communication. Um, you know, there's, there's always, you know, multiple things we can fix and failures and things like that. But communication has always been the the, you know, the, the elusive never can quite always get that one figured out 100% of the time. You know, when you talk about how do you get everyone from working from the latest, you know, that's, that's the struggle. Because, you know, you got people that work different shifts, they will have days off. Um, and, and like Darren said, the, the information here has changed so rapidly. So we, we did very similar things, you know, we leveraged multiple streams, you know, and what can we do to ensure that we're getting this information out to everyone um, in a timely basis and get everyone communicating from the, the same sheet of music that we're all, you know, talking about the same thing and not something that was a week ago. So a uh, couple of things we, we've leveraged, our, we call it our no do share. Um, this kind of a, a newsletter that we pushed out uh, at the beginning every single day. And then we all, like Darren said, we scaled back to three times a week. So now we're at two times a week. And that's, you know, the, the highlights. That's covering the most pertinent changes, the biggest change of information, things like that. Originally, we stood up our command center um, late February um, and really had a dedicated line for a staff had a question. Um, no such thing as a stupid question right now. I mean, it's all just so, so you know, volatile. We'd, we'd rather you call and ask. Um, and we can figure it out. And that helped the information to flow up as well as, as back down, um, you know, to those, those single points that maybe didn't quite hear the message. We have a standing call 9 a.m. every single morning that we discuss, you know, what's going well, what's, what didn't go well from the previous day, what do we need to work on, how are our supplies doing, how, how's everything, you know, what has changed from the Department of Public Health or the CDC, uh, for us, Joint Commission, some of our regulatory agencies, stuff like that. Um, and that's all of management and anyone else that just wants to dial in, they, they can get that 9 a.m. update uh, every single day. We leverage our screen savers to push out information. Um, one of the unique things and what's nice about being a hospital is almost everyone here has a care phone, essentially an iPhone that's locked down to, to the physical hospital. And we're able to push information out. Um, luckily, uh, you know, we had the ARC app on those phones early on as we uh, rolled that out. So as, as these COVID plans changed, you know, staff had that readily at their fingertips. They just open up the app, it's right there. They can pull it up and see what, you know, the latest is. And that, that, was, that was key for us, I think, because otherwise 
we, we might change the policy, change our procedure, email that out to everybody, put it on our intranet. But, you know, sometimes the staff don't go there. I can't get to a desktop or I'm working, you know, over here and don't have access right now and I can't get to a binder. Everyone has it on their care phone. Just pull the app right up. Boom, there it is. You know, your fire safety, all, all that type of emergency documentation is readily accessible for them. And, and that was key, you know, like, how do you get the information in everyone's hands readily accessible? Because like Darren said, this is changing so rapidly. I mean, especially at the beginning, I mean, we were talking, what I was doing in the morning changed from sometimes what I was doing that afternoon. Um, and luckily, I think some of that, that's changed over time to where it's, it's you know, we have a, a better cadence of change. Um, it's more routine and not, you know, so volatile and, and, you know, hour to hour or day to day. Now it's more, you know, every other week to every other week. Um, and staff have a chance to, to decompress somewhat and, you know, reflect on what we've done and, and how it worked. Uh, but the communication piece has always been, you know, the, the hardest piece to, to conquer. Because how do you get all the information, the, the, the current information, to everybody all at the same time and no one gets left out. So again, like, like I said, we, we really leveraged the technology to help with that. No, that's outstanding. You know, it's, it, that leads me to our next poll question here. And that is, how effective are your current technology solutions prepared to help workers, A, work remotely, maintain social distancing, access, update and share documents, maintain PM schedules, and provide a high level of customer service with fewer resources. Is it highly effective, moderately effective, needs improvement, minimally effective, or not helpful? Please select one of the ones below. Okay, we're wrapping it up here. Let's see what our results are. Highly effective, 38%. Moderately effective, 42%. That's outstanding. Needs improvement is 16% or minimally effective. That's interesting. Uh, let's scroll down here, and then 0% is not helpful. You know, I think when it comes to technology, too, one of the things that I always tr try to stress is it, your technology is only as good as you can have remote access to that stuff, too. You know, Darren brought up a really good point. I remember when I was on site, at Darren's office one day, and he showed me this this phone that he's got, and it allowed him to access a phone line no matter where the heck he was. I forget what the the phone was called, and I'll ask Darren about, to answer that in just a few minutes. But but basically, he had phone access even when I didn't or I wouldn't. And it but having that remote access to information, meaning on the device, so you don't have to have a cell connection, you don't have to have Wi-Fi, but being able to have that information, think about it, your phone is a small computer, okay? You can download documentation onto your phone as well, you know, and then apps and things like that that update, um, like Mark was talking about, as you update, it should update on everybody's device too. So think about it that way. So let's jump over to our next question here. How will technology uh, how will technology change the way teams collect, organize, and share information? So think about how you're going to digitize everything for that remote access. Remember, I said earlier, one of the challenges that I've heard re recently was that that plan room is not doing me any good when my team's all remote. Or how do I make sure that I can not only digitize that stuff, search for it so it can be shared? Or Think about that mobile-first mentality. Everybody all of a sudden was mobile. Think about that. Your entire team or the vast majority of your team was mobile. In, in a blink, you had to be mobile. So everybody started using Zoom. Everybody started using other t meeting type uh, remote meeting software. But were they able to access everything just like they were if they were sitting at their desk? Most cases it was no. So Darren, why don't you share a little information about what you're doing and, and how how that's really impacted you and also a little bit about that phone that we were talking about. Yeah, sure, David. So that phone is actually AT&T FirstNet. 
So um, it's for emergency responders and emergency management qualifies under that. So for those people that are out there, you might want to look at your uh, AT&T stores and talk about FirstNet because they've built a network for emergency responders. So if the regular phone lines are down, it switches over to a band that is basically built for emergency responders. And there's a few other carriers that have something similar to that, but I found that the, the AT&T phone works great. And uh, they've given me one of the uh, first versions of this phone. It, it looks like a, a giant brick um, that I can use as a hammer as well, but it, it lasts multiple days. It's great. So I have access to things and that's actually come in handy because in the first few weeks of this, things were extremely overloaded with everybody trying to get information. Our technology was continually changing. And so one of the things that we did uh, being an academic, you know, education and out there trying to make sure we have access to students is that we had to go remotely like within a couple of days. Um, all of a sudden our president at the university made a decision that all of our classes with two weeks left in the winter quarter, were going to go remote online. And we didn't know what the spring quarter uh, was going to have in store quite yet, but we still had to finish out winter and then have spring break. And so everybody was frantic about how are they going to use technology? What are they going to use? What are they going to do? And so our IT department did a really good job of making sure that we had the latest, greatest access. And we were teaching via Zoom and we were doing Microsoft Teams and we were using a few other things, but it also became very frantic as to like, well, this group uses this and this group uses that. They don't talk to each other. So we've tried to narrow it down to at least just one or two platforms to use. So Microsoft Teams and our Zoom uh, for meetings and things like that, and we can share information in there. And I'm sure that everybody learned how to use Zoom and not use it and all the stories that are related to what you hear and see on Zoom as well. But we tried to make sure we collected all the information and put it in one spot. And then we also used our websites quite a bit because everybody was getting inundated with questions about what's the latest, greatest things like uh, Mark had talked about. Everything is changing from one thing in the morning to the other afternoon of the next day. So we started updating and pushing out information saying, here's where you can find the latest, greatest. You can, we added the link to whatever, um, you know, technology that we were using, but we tried to push it out there to everybody to say, here's where you can go find the latest, greatest information. And then we started a, a FAQ page on our website because everybody was getting all these questions. And so every time a question came up, we would actually put it on the FAQs and provide an answer. And then um, it got to be where people are asking questions. I would just uh, copy and paste the website link and then send it to them and say, here you go, look under this heading. And if you still can't find it, let me know because as information uh, was flowing, it kept changing on a constant basis or it was kind of buried deep inside of things. So it was really hard at first, but we were able to kind of organize it and put it in a manner where we put the important stuff up top, what has changed, and then other additional information and links. And the other thing that we did is provided the latest, greatest links to the state, the county, the CDC, and things like that so that we were able to collect it. And for our facilities information, things were changing every day with our teams as people were rotating days on, days off, schedules, you know, and people were doing things that wasn't normally their job that needed access to things. So we had to step back and take a look at it and say, okay, who now is doing a job that doesn't normally have access to things that they need to have it. And so we were able to update their access to um, the different platforms that we're using to make sure they're on it. And then our meetings that we would have multiple times a week or sometimes every day when we first started this, we would re you know, emphasize, this is where you can find the information. This is what you're doing. And we would give an opportunity during our in-person Zoom meetings, as we call them, and opportunities. Anybody have any questions? Is everybody clear on the latest guidance and stuff? And we would include it in the meeting link or in our chat windows and things like that of where the things are at. So we would, you know, talk about it. People would see it. People would hear it. And so we have all those different learning uh, ways that people connect. And so we were making sure that we covered it as best mm -hmm. as possible. But it's still a challenge out there. And we're still finding that right now. It's like, where do we have this and where do we do this? And then uh, sure. you know, we're, we're trying to put all the information together, but for the most part, it's worked for us and we collect it and organize it and we share it in a, in a similar manner. No, that's great. And Mark, why don't you jump in here? Yeah, I, I think the, the sharing is, is a tough one. So what we try to do is integrate a lot of our, our systems. And like, you know, the worst thing is that our, maybe our facility system over here that does work orders doesn't talk to our safety system over there, or, or these teams don't you know have access to, to different systems. So we, we put a lot of emphasis on making sure they all integrate. 
So that way that information is able to flow from one system into the other and we're able to, you know, see it in different ways as well. And then, you know, like Darren said, getting everyone access, um, you know, before security might not have had access to the facilities or vice versa. And, and now, you know, it's, it's needed because we're working so interdependently on one another and that information, you know, we shouldn't keep it a secret. You know, the last thing we want to do is, is with, you know, the shared workspaces and social distancing and, and things like that. Now, some of our workplace controls being put in place is we really need to not limit the access to information, but probably, you know, overshare that information somewhat. Because uh, last thing you want is, well, I didn't know that about that, or I didn't know that working in silos, that team over there was doing something different. Um, so really getting it to where the, the information flows from, you know, program to program or, or uh, system to system, and as well as people have access to those other systems that traditionally they probably didn't. Uh, but now with how fast we're moving and, and everyone working so close to, to, together on projects and, you know, remotely, uh, to just make sure that that information is being shared and everyone's aware of it to, to take action and make things happen. Sure, and I think that's a, that's a great segue for us to get into some of our questions because, you know, again, like we like you just both said, it's accessing the information when the heck you need it because it is a moving target. It is changing just constantly, and like you both said, daily, weekly, monthly, it's changing. The things that happened at the beginning are not the things that are happening today. So why don't we start answering a few of your questions? Great. Thank you for that informative presentation, everybody. Uh, as he mentioned, we'll now begin our question and answer session. So attendees, if you haven't done so already, please submit your questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen. Our first question is, have you reorganized your facilities office to accommodate social distancing requirements? Yeah, Mark, why don't you take that one? Uh, yeah, we have. Um, we. we originally had a very open workspace, uh, which I think, you know, previously was the recommended, uh, you know, to have collaboration, things like that. And now with the social distancing requirements and things, um, our facilities team has gone in and put in physical barriers um, to, to handle that and keep people a little separate. Uh, we've also changed uh, some of the shifts to where we don't have everyone working at the same time. And then, you know, with moving some staff off site repurpose those other work areas to accommodate those that do have to be here. Um, and I think that's been, you know, uh, successful for us. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that with the shifting schedules and the, the even working on, on secondary schedules where even splitting time between in the office and off, you know, offsite onsite, it's been a, that's been one of the biggest dramatic changes that I've seen as well. So what's our next question? Our next question is, actually, we just touched on it a bit. Have you staggered work shifts? And if so, how are you managing staff working during those hours? Gotcha. Hey, Darren, why don't you field that one? Yeah, so we've actually moved staff around. We've uh, created extra workspace for them. And then um, we've tried to figure out out of our work order system what the priority is and then what can be done safely. And so we've also given the option for some people to continue if they can to work from home, but there are some people like our custodians and our maintenance crews, they, they can't really work from home. So we've asked them to come up with an alternate schedule to find out what accommodates them. Cause at the same time, we have to look at what their needs are. And we found that reaching out to them and asking them what works for you because they have to deal with school being out, childcare issues and other things like that. And so we want to be as flexible as possible that we can with their family needs and everything else. So that's something that we're going through right now as we get to bring a few more people back to work, but they're given the option of to say, okay, I normally work these days, but can I work these days? As long as the work's getting done, the hours are getting put in, things are very flexible right now. And it seems to be a win-win situation for everybody. And that's really nice. No, that's fantastic. I, I tell you, I, I certainly want to give some kudos to our unsung heroes on the custodial staff. Those people are, are cleaning everything, whether it's in the hospital or a school or, or a, a municipality. Those folks are, are, are doing extra cleaning. And, and like you said, you're shifting some of those folks around from other departments to even help with that kind of custodial type task. But 
those are truly some of the unsung folks within any organization today. So, so what's our next question? I think we have time for one more. Great. Uh, the next question is a logistical question. What is the best way for us to get our paper documents digitized? Oh, sure. I can, I can actually field that one. Um, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that when you get your documents uh, digitized, they are in a format that you can all obviously access them on your phone, your tablet, or your, your desktop, wherever the heck you are. So you need to work with a group that knows what the heck they're doing. You know, we, we do that, but they're, they're, you, know, you want to make sure that it's in a format that everybody can access it and, and share that information out with whoever needs it, whether it's a contractor, whether it's internal, external. But at the end of the day, you don't want to work with a group that has to outsource. So think about that. You know, you, you go to company A, and then they have to outsource it to somebody to scan it. Then they have to outsource it to somebody to put it all together, all of that. No, no, no. Work with a group that knows what the heck they're doing, and they can provide that back to you so that you can use it. It's a tool. Okay, think about your digital documents are no different than your paper documents. It's a tool. You need access to the information wherever the heck you are, no matter what time it is. You're in the middle of the night. You've got an accident. Something goes wrong. You need to be able to access that information. So that's, that's my advice. Great. Well, everyone, thank you for answering those questions. Great job. Um, before we close out this presentation, though, there are just a few more important pieces of information that we'd like to share with everyone. Don't forget that you can find our past courses, including this one, on our website, available for you to view at any time. And we have dozens of topics, so visit our on-demand courses today and watch now. Be sure to stay connected to Buildings by visiting us on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And as a reminder, a copy of today's presentation slides are available by clicking on the Resources tab on the Courses page on our website. Thanks again to our partner, ARC Facilities. Thank you again to today's speakers, and also thanks to all of you for joining us today. Please visit the Buildings site where you can view other educational courses offering ideas and solutions for your everyday problems as well as submit for your continuing education credit. Have a great day, and we'll see you again soon.